Well, in her new book, author Sally Bedell Smith, one of the royal family's authorised biographers, claims that Meghan Markle is yet another domineering American woman who has come between two royal brothers. She also brands Harry a weak man. Well, joining us now is our favourite royal commentator, <laughs> Mr. Michael Cole. Hi, I'm Michael. How are you doing? <laughs> We had a <laughs> Alex. It's so nice to see you both. Oh, it's you too, a Michael. Always a pleasure. We had a very lively conversation at the start of, uh, uh, of this program about Meghan Markle and whether she was a narcissist or not. And I basically said, "Well, look, I don't know her personally. I don't want to sound like a social justice warrior, Me Too movement leftist, but I don't really think that I can say that, as I don't have any personal relationship with her, that I can have an opinion on this other than empirical evidence, where she basically uprooted a man from." his family home, moved him abroad, made him do a big sit-down interview of one of the biggest talk show hosts in America, slagging off his family, and seems to do every single launch relating to Meghan Markle, or, you know, at a perfectly chosen moments to interrupt whatever the royals' plans are. Hmm. I think it's, um, I think it's a little unfair to uh, compare Meghan of Montecito with the Belle of Baltimore, because uh, Wallace Simpson was the unwitting cause of the great abdication crisis of 1936. But after that, uh, she was very, very discreet. She never issued uh, a public statement or said a public word of criticism of the royal family. Indeed, when the Duke was declining, uh, she welcomed Prince Charles and Princess Anne. And then the Queen and the Duke of e Edinburgh came. There she is with the, the Duke uh, in happier times. And she welcomed uh, the royal family to her house in the Bois de Boulogne, which I visited about 30 times in my life. Mm -hmm. And uh, she, when she died in May 1986, the RAF flew her back to Britain, quite an honor. Uh, she had a, a, a funeral service at St. George's Chapel and she was interred next to the Duke in Frogmore, the Royal Burial Ground, which of course is very close by Frogmore Cottage, from which Meghan and Harry uh, did their moonlight flit with their, uh, uh, with their son Archie clutched to their breasts and flew off on a scheduled flight to Canada to begin their self-imposed exile eventually in California. So I think it's a bit of a tough comparison by Sally Biddle Smith uh, w w between the two women, because I think they were completely different. Uh, and actually, uh, Wallace Simpson, who didn't look to become queen, that was the Duke's intention. Of course, it was refused by Stanley Baldwin, the prime minister of the day. Uh, and, but after that, uh, she conducted herself perfectly, perfectly properly and was, as I say, invited when the Duke died in 1971. She stayed at Buckingham Palace. I don't think that's going to happen with uh, Meghan Markle anytime soon. Uh, absolutely. But I think uh, the other tenet, if you like, of this comparison is the men. Uh, so uh, Edward VIII has always been depicted as a rather weak man who certainly was enthralled to Wallace Simpson. Uh, people remember he basically skipped to her beat. Whatever she wanted, he did. So she was in control of that marriage. And I think what people are suggesting is the dynamics of the marriage between Harry and Meghan are pretty much the same. And uh, you do kind of get that feeling. I was thinking when you and I, or when we spoke last week, Michael, yeah. about the way she sort of hijacked the day of the Diana Awards to announce uh, the launch of her new uh, lifestyle website. Harry, uh, only later that day, had to go on to a Zoom, live Zoom, and make a speech to the Diana Awards in London. Uh, William had been there live earlier on. And you would have thought, that Harry might have said to Meghan, not today, Meghan, do it a different day. This is the wrong day to do it. I suspect he might have said that, but was immediately told to shut up. That's basically the way I think it goes. And don't forget, remember Harry's famous uh, statement, what Meghan wants, Meghan gets. And that's certainly yeah. the case with him. It's this, this comparison, I think, is more to do with weak men than powerful women. I think you said it out perfectly. Uh, it is true that the Duke uh, of Windsor, and I know this from talking to Sidney Johnson, his ballot for many, many years, he was obsessed uh, with the Duchess of Windsor, Wallace, uh, until his dying day. Uh, she would have been quite content to have remained uh, his mistress. In fact, she actually loved quite deeply her second husband, Ernest Simpson, 
and they remained friends throughout their life. It was the Duke who was pushing on and, and had to have this woman. He gave her up. He gave up the throne. He gave up the empire. He gave it up for the woman he loved, as he said in his memorable uh, statement of, of abdication. He couldn't carry on doing the job without the woman he loved. Uh, in America, where they're rather blunt about these things, they're certainly saying that um, Meghan wears the trousers in Montecito and the Duke of Sussex um, bends to her will. I think when we've seen it in action, when you watch that Oprah Winfrey interview, which was quite clearly her initiative with her friend Oprah, yeah. he looked there and to my eye, he looked extremely embarrassed and uncomfortable about being there, particularly when she strayed into the toxic area of, of racism and the allegation that uh, people within the royal family had uh, raised questions about the tone of the skin tone of their then unborn child who uh, was born uh, and is Prince Archie. Um, all of that he looked uncomfortable with. So is he being led by the nose? Uh, we'd have to be, I think, within the compound to know exactly what goes on. But I think it's a reasonable supposition uh, that she certainly gets what she wants. She's certainly uh, laying out the um, parameters. She's uh, making her game plan. And who knows what it is? Uh, certainly Wally Simpson didn't have any uh, great plans for herself as a, as, a, as a member of the royal family. Uh, and she didn't have uh, political plans. And apparently uh, Meghan does have political yeah. plans mm. and she has other other purposes. Indeed. Well, I'd say she'd make a good politician because most politicians are slightly narcissistic. And I'm no <laughs> psychologist, right? <clears throat> but if I was going to give it a stab, I would suggest that if a narcissist wanted to set up a business, it would be something called American Riviera Orchard, where they have such a high opinion of themselves, <laughs> they think the rest of the world should want to emulate their <laughs> lives and buy <laughs> their beige tat. <laughs> so, that's my you know, sort of... Uh, they're jammed. Well, they're jammed. It, it's, it's, often, it's often said that politics is, is show business for ugly people. Yeah. Perhaps Megan's going to try and make politics politics for beautiful people. Yeah, she you know, certainly is. She Michael. obviously sees herself in that role. Let's, let's ask you about this. Uh, there's another story this morning on the front page of The Sun saying Kate has been seen out and about for the first time. Well, it's not strictly true. There's no picture of no. her, but apparently she went to the, Win the local Windsor farm shop with the kids, looked happy and healthy and beaming and smiling. Uh, you sort of suspect this is another sort of publicity device by Kensington Palace to uh, drip feed us with information that makes it look as if her recovery is full steam ahead. Uh, so we've had that, we've had these pictures, the pictures of her and William in the car, the picture of her and her mum, Carol Middleton, in the car. Uh, why don't they just get, since it's quite clear that Kate is up and about now, why don't they mm. just get her to address the camera and say, listen, everyone, I'm absolutely fine. As I told you, uh, I'll be around after Easter. As I always told you, it would take a while. Please stop with all this nonsense about me being dead <laughs> or my love life or whatever. Just leave me alone and I'll be back with you in a couple of weeks. Wouldn't that cure a multitude of sins? I honestly could not agree with you more. I've actually written something exactly to that point uh, a few minutes ago and sent it off to uh, a newspaper. Um, it is absolutely true. This, these pictures or this trip to the local farm shop, all to the good, shows she's ambulatory, she's out and about, she's making progress. But the only way to scotch these absurd, vile, foolhardy, mad rumours and speculation uh, is to actually make a statement. It's no good briefing uh, individual reporters that she'll say something in an informal situation with members of the public after she returns to public life. That will not stem this avalanche, this uh, tsunami, if you will, of ill will that is swilling around uh, on, on the uh, in social media. Uh, a simple statement, because as she has said herself, uh, there's tremendous goodwill towards her. Uh, people love her. They want to know more about her. They will be un not just understanding, they'll be supportive. And if she has a chronic condition or any sort of condition, making, us, making it known, even in general terms, will, I think, do good. It will help people to sympathise. It will make people understand. And it will wish her well. 
And I think that can only be a good thing, particularly uh, as she gets back to full uh, public life and uh, a proper uh, health uh, within her family while she's bringing up three lively young children. Yeah, I mean, I don't understand why she doesn't just do some sort of five minute Zoom appearance with one of her charities like Kids Play or something. You know, we don't have to see anything other than the sort of uh, headshots, do we? But it does make me wonder if maybe she's having some sort of treatments which affects the way she looks, or affects her face. That's something I can certainly sympathise with oh, as yeah. someone who woke up looking like a hammerhead shark this morning. Um, <laughs> but... Alex, uh, Alex, what you're saying sounds too much like uh, common sense for Kensington yeah. Palace because, my goodness, they have dropped the ball on this. Uh, those highly paid PR professionals who've been brought in by Prince William to KP, they shouldn't have allowed the uh, phony uh, photograph fiasco to happen. Good staff work would have prevented that. They now have the opportunity to put things right. And actually, a simple bulletin, if she's not up to making a statement, a simple bulletin, putting it in simple terms. Uh, we don't have to know every detail, but we should be allowed to know which way things are going, because that is the only way to stop the stupid speculation, mm. which is damaging. It's damaging, it's damaging. Uh, to the royal family and it's damaging to, to public life they, in this they country. Still, Michael, they, they still seem to see the way out of this is to do it in whispers and in winks. They're letting the press yeah. know fairly soon she will go and meet the public somewhere and she will talk to someone on mic about her condition and then you'll find out a bit more about it. How circuitous, how ridiculous. Mm. Just make a statement to us. It would, it would kill all this nonsense stone dead. So let's hope they uh, do see some common sense fairly soon. But good to get more of your common sense, as always, always. Michael. Thank you so much. Michael Cole there.